Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm McKenna. I'm the owner of Murder by the Book in Houston, Texas, and we're so excited tonight to have three authors for our three dog night. We've got three authors who all write fabulous um, dog mystery series, and it's going to be really fun to hear them all talk about them um, on the same panel. So um, as always, if you have questions and you're watching on YouTube, you can put those in the live chat. If you're watching here on Facebook, you can put those in the comments and I'll get to them um, about 30 minutes or so in. Don't be shy. There's no such thing as a dumb question. Um, while I have your attention, I will also say that um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, we have a pretty cool subscription plan, Murder by the Box. Um, more details can be found at murderbythebox.com. But there's um, three monthly mailed subscriptions that just show up at your doorstep, one best of month. There's um, Crime Fiction Legends and there's Cozy Corner. So a little bit of something for everyone. And people are um, enjoying those. We started them in January and feedback's been terrific. If you're interested in um, learning more about the authors or their books. I've just dropped a link in the comments, both on Facebook and YouTube for um, ordering. And um, actually, I think I just put it in the live chat. I'll fix that in a second. But uh, I will be putting a link in the comments shortly for more information and to order um, books. We have a busy uh, schedule this week of virtual events. We've got Linda Castillo and Sarah Stewart Taylor tomorrow night. Jeff Abbott, Hillary Davidson, and Meg Gardner also coming up. And then um, Sean Cosby interviewed by Alex Segura. So it'll be a busy week around here and we hope to see you coming back for more events. Um, but on to the stars of the show. I'm gonna start tonight with Jeffrey Burton. Hi Jeffrey, how are you? Hey McKenna, thanks for having me. Of course, it's a pleasure. It's nice to meet you, albeit virtually. Hopefully the next book will get to be in person. Oh, it'd be great. And I love your three dog night. It brings back memories of when my um, older sister would let me go skating with her friends and they tended to play the uh, Joy to the World song, yeah. you know, the Jeremiah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, well, I, I think it's gonna be fun. We we had, you know, a meeting of the minds with a couple of the publicists and we all came up with this this title. So we'll see how it goes. Um, let me do your official bio real quick and we'll bring on the other guys. Um, Jeffrey Burton is the author of The Finders, The Chessman, and The Eulogist. He's an active member of Mystery Writers of America, the International Thriller Writers, and the Horror Writers Association, and lives in St. Paul, Minnesota with his family. And I will mention that um, the book he's here tonight to discuss is called The Keepers, and it's um, the second in the Mace Reed Canine Mystery Series. Thanks again for being here. Um, also, we have next up, we're going to call him Spencer Quinn tonight, but we all know him as Peter Abrams as well. Good to see you. How are you? Thanks for having me, Kenna. Nice to see you. Nice to see you as always. Um, Spencer Quinn is the pen name for Peter Abrahams, the Edgar winning New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of the Chet and Bernie mystery series, as well as the number one New York Times bestselling Bowser and Birdie series for middle grade readers. He lives in Cape Cod with his wife, Diana, and dog Pearl. And um, the book he's talking about tonight is the 11th in the Chet and Bernie series, Tender is the Bite. So I can't wait to hear more about that in a little bit. Thanks for um, having me. Of course. Last but not least, we have David Rosenfeld. Hi, David. Hi, McKenna. How are you doing? I'm good. Good to see you as always. I'm going to do your bio here too. Right. David Rosenfeld is the Edgar nominated and Seamus Award winning author of more than 20 Andy Carpenter novels, including One Dog Night, Collard, and Deck the Hounds. It's um, it's spinoff series, The K-Team, the Doug Brock thriller series, which starts with Fade to Back, and standalone thrillers, including Heart of a Killer and On Borrowed Time. Rosenfeld and his wife live in Maine with an ever-changing pack of rescue dogs. Their epic cross-country move with 25 of these dogs, culminating in the creation of the Terra Foundation, is chronicled in Dog Tripping. And you are here tonight to discuss uh, Dog Eat Dog, correct? All right. Um, I will say that we do have signed book plates. If you're interested in ordering Dog Eat Dog, I think we're going to be getting those in the mail any day. Um, and let me get started with the first question and then I'll correct my uh, comment drop. Again, if you have any questions and you're in the audience watching, don't be shy. Put those in the comments and we'll get to them in a little bit. All right. So first off, I think that we're going to have a lot of people watching tonight who have read one or two of you, but maybe not all three. So 
my first question is not specifically about the new book, but it's just, can you introduce um, our viewers to your main human and your main dog? And um, why don't we start with Jeffrey? Oh, okay, yeah. I um, The main human is a, a dog handler named Mason Mace Reed. And he, uh, he lives in the outskirts of Chicago and has an obedience school, but he's also specializes in human remains, detection dogs, um, cadaver dogs. And he's, in the beginning of the finders, he's at kind of a low point in his life. And he comes across, is able to adopt and rescue um, a golden retriever puppy from Chicago, Chicago Animal Care and Control. And as he begins to train her, she um, becomes an excellent cadaver dog. And it's about the different uh, troubles that he and he um, kind of nicknames his pack of dogs, the finders. Yeah. And it's about the troubles that they get into and hopefully out of. Perfect. Okay. How about you, um, Spencer? Well, Chet is the dog and Bernie is the detective. But all we know about anything is what Chet knows because Chet narrates the series and he's not a talking dog. He's as canine as I could make him. So everything we know about Bernie, whom he adores, we see filtered through the eyes of Chet. So some of what we might think of as facts are in fact not facts, but just Chet's perceptions, which, which can be odd. So, but Bernie is a private eye uh, who works alone. He former military person, we know that. He was at West Point. He went there a lot, partly because he was a very good pitcher in baseball, but he's blown out his arm, but his arm is still very good for playing fetch. And Chet is a dog who flunked out of canine school on the last, the very last day on the leaping test. Only the leaping test was left and leaping is his very best thing. All he remembers of that event is that a cat was involved and there might've been some blood. And, but that was also the day he see, he's a very optimistic being, Chet. And, and that day, the silver lining, well, it's more than the silver lining, was the best thing that ever happened to him because that's the day he got together with me. Excellent. Um, okay, David, you're up. Who do you have? The main human is Andy Carpet. There is a lawyer from Patterson, New Jersey. He's my alter ego, except he's thinner and younger, and he's a lawyer. Um, I'm not sure there's a main dog. I mean, people, ref Andy's dog is named Tara. But Tara is a great golden retriever named after our original dog. And she really had nothing to do with the story. She, you know, she's Andy's dog. But, um, each book, or almost each book, has a dog that sort of leads Andy into a case. Andy is not inclined, he's, he's wealthy, he's not inclined to take cases. He shares my work ethic. <laughs> and But something happens with a dog usually that, that brings him into the case. He has a rescue foundation like we do. Um, so each, each episode has its own dog that becomes the main dog. But people still think of it as the, the Tara books. That's yeah. what to it. And when they say that when they go into a bookstore, they skim ahead to the end to make sure they still see Tara <laughs> so that they know she doesn't die during the story. Yeah. I might ever kill her, right? In 2002, when Andy, in the first book, she was nine years old, and now she's seven. So <laughs> she's okay. She's not dying anytime soon. Yeah, excellent. Well, you know, those readers, we don't want anything bad to happen to the dogs, especially the ones we've, we know and love. All right, so now deeper dive, um, what's happening in the newest book? And uh, I'm just gonna go in this same order because this is the order you guys are on my screen. So it'll be easier to keep it um, straight. So for now, for the ne next couple of questions, we'll start with Jeffrey again. Well, I just wanna first say that I'm a, I'm a fan of these two gentlemen and I, I owe Spencer a huge thanks because he gave me a great blurb for the finders last year. And um, I can't, uh, what? And a true one, one I meant, so. Well, thank you, sir. It's nice to thank you in virtual and perhaps someday in person. Um, well, the pleasure was mine and I enjoy reading good books and yours was one. So you know, and I, I can't, um, 
I can't read or hear the word pant leg without thinking of Chet and breaking into laughter as pant leg time, got him by the pant leg. And, um, you know, David, I, I love your books. Um, legal thrillers, dogs, and a smart alecky attorney, you know, I'm there. And if folks are um, in between Andy Carpenter books, you, you've got to check out um, David's Facebook pages because his posts are, are hilarious. Um, anyway, I read each of your books also, one of them, and they were so good that it was like annoying. I was <laughs> aggravating. Well, thank you, sir. Never again. Never again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I got interviewed a week ago by, uh, oh, I don't know, a gentleman at Red Carpet Crash. And, you know, I've been fortunate. I've gotten some good reviews, but he goes, He's, that was badass. And I'm like, okay. So I uh, went to my website and put in quotes, badass, Red Carpet Crash. But um, my uh, my most recent book, um, The Keepers, the, the, the first one, The Finders, was kind of like Mace Reed and his pack of cadaver dogs um, versus uh, serial killers. And in The Keepers, it kind of pits uh, Mace and his, uh, his pack of dogs against um, some, some police corruption at kind of the highest level. And that's kind of where it starts. And there's um, several other villains and they're in a tight spot. Excellent. All right. Um, how about you, Spencer? Well, Tender is the Bite is the new book. First, I people ask, um, should the, the Chet and Bernie series be read in order? Well, they're narrated by Chet, and that's a question he would never ask. The Chet and Bernie series can be read in any order. So you could, even if you read none of the others, you could start with Tender is the Bite. I love the title, and I, I'm free to say that because I didn't make it up. Um, I'm, I made up Dog on It, which is the first title. Uh, no, I'm sorry, that was a friend of mine suggested that. I did Thereby Hangs a Tail, which was the second one. And now basically readers, I've got a list of over, over 100 titles and readers come up with them. So a reader came up with Tender as the Bite. It was better than anything I had and, and we used it. And anyone who suggests a title that is used in the series gets a free signed copy. I just wanna say that right here on YouTube tonight. Anyway, Tender is the Bite um, is the first time I've really tackled politics head on uh, in the series because you can even know it's narrated by a dog in a crazy way. You can deal with actually deep and dark things and important things and just slide them in. It's, it's very high. I didn't even realize when I started that that could happen. Anyway, there's a, there's a powerful senator. He has an even more powerful wife. There's a beautiful small town girl who tries to hire Bernie and then backs out at the last minute and he doesn't understand why. There are, uh, there's top shelf Ukrainian vodka and most important, especially in a book about politics, a ferret plays a role. <laughs> Perfect. Um, all right, David, how about you? Um, Doggy Dog is, starts like all the others, or most of the others, where a dog leads him in. He and Andy and his wife, Lori, are walking their dogs on the street, and a guy is kicking a dog. And Lori, who is the non-coward in the family, goes to intervene, but some passerby intervenes more quickly, saves the dog, beats the guy up. The police arrive, and the guy's taken into custody because he's wanted for two murders in Maine. So Andy, of course, is intrigued that anybody who would, knowing he's wanted, that would intervene to save a dog is Andy's kind of guy. Um, it's the 20, I think the 23rd book in the series, so I'm not exactly breaking new ground here. But um, this one is slightly unique, I would say, in that it doesn't take place in New Jersey. It's um, one book girl in the fifth book in the series was in Wisconsin. This book is in Maine, which is where I live. Um, so it gave me a chance to have more fun with, you know, make fun of Maine rather than make fun of New Jersey for the 23rd time. <laughs> um, and what breed, what type of dog are we dealing with this time? A pug. Okay. That's, well, that's you know, pug lovers are crazy. He actually becomes a main, a, Andy's third dog at the end of the book. Spoiler alert. So now Andy has three dogs. But I basically pick the dog by when they send me the book jacket, right? They have fun with it. Whenever dog's on the cover, becomes a dog in the book. So. <laughs> 
Perfect. Um, okay, I'm gonna go in reverse order this time. So David, we're just gonna start right back with you. Um, so what in your background drew you to writing mysteries and more specifically to this love of dogs and having dogs in your books? Um, I don't think anything in my background drew me to mysteries. I mean, my, my background is as a movie executive, yep. not a writer, as a movie executive. And, you know, mysteries actually over the years have become less and less significant in movies, um, at least in, in features. Um, so I, I just, it was more, I was drawn to the legal drama. I love that, always have. I, I think the verdict is the most dramatic moment in, in humankind. So I really like that. Uh, not so much a mystery. In fact, when I wrote my first book, which was open and shut, I didn't know it was a mystery. I didn't know anything about writing. I didn't know it was a mystery. I thought it was a th uh, legal uh, courtroom drama. And it wasn't until Warner Books gave it to their mysterious press imprint that I realized it was a mystery. So, <laughs> so I don't think anything in my past drew me to that. But um, dogs, it's because you know we have a long history with dogs. We you know, we started a foundation in California. We saved like 4,000 dogs. Um, and we've always had a house full of them. And I really mean full of them. Um, so that became a natural thing for me. But it wasn't until the sixth book that the dog became significant to the plot, which coincidentally is when I started to sell books. <laughs> <laughs> so trust me, there will always be dogs in these books. <laughs> That's funny. All right. How about you, um, Spencer? Well, what, okay. So what drew me to mystery? I, um, I think at the time I started to become a, my mother taught me almost everything I know about writing by the time I was about 11 years old. It's a very strange story. Um, so a lot of, not just the technical part of it, but even a lot of the imaginative part, the, the things she taught me about how to push every idea as far as you can and to put your own spin on every single sentence and and to use fewer words to say the same thing and never to do it like anyone else. So I had all this growing up and it was, I guess in retrospect, it was obvious I was going to become a writer. But um, when I first tried it, I happened to have been reading mysteries as specifically they were the mysteries of Ross MacDonald. Yeah. who was this genius of American mystery. And so my first book, which came out in 1980, The Fury of Rachel Manette, was a mystery thriller kind of thing. I, I write crime fiction. I've been all over the different parts of it. And, uh, and I've just stayed there because it's my belief that you can write a deep story with, with, with deep characterization, tone, mood, and thematic things, just like in what they call literary fiction, except you can have a driving plot at the same time. And that's always been what I've tried to do. And that's what I'm still trying to do. Specifically on dogs, um, I've had dogs in, I guess you'd call them trot on rolls in, in many of my books, like Oblivion, there's a dog named Buster who plays an important role, for, but very briefly. And, and then one day my wife said, you should do something with dogs. And I, I just knew right away she meant the dog moved the dog to the center. And I just thought also that the dog's going to tell the story. So I, I went to my office where I am right now. And I, I wrote the first page of what became dog on it just to see what it would look like on the page. And, and it, uh, it just, it continued. That's where, and that's what I'm still doing. Yeah. But also we've had dogs. I mean, and I love dogs. I mean, as I think the three of us, or probably the four of us in this screen do. I mean, I just, and dogs are in my, you know, we've, we've had as many as three right now, there's only one, but I mean, she's in the office while I'm writing every day. It's, it's like, like she's saying to me, Pete, you can do another line, you can do another chapter, don't stop now. Meanwhile, she's lounging on the couch. Yeah, yeah, mine's right here on the carpet next to me. Yeah. I'm hoping she just stays silent. All right, um, Jeffrey, your turn. Yeah, my, my beagle is lying right next to me and hopefully going to stay silent. Um, yeah, I was I was a bookworm growing up and read a lot of the different genres, but then just kind of kind of focused in on more mystery thrillers. And I think, um, I don't know, about 20 years ago when my daughter was young, um, I just started writing short stories. And I had I had, a you know, a bit of luck with that. 
And then I go, okay, well, let's, let me try writing a mystery. And so I wound up, um, you know, a lot of the short stories I wrote would have the, you know, the typical old Henry ending where, oh, it changes everything. This turns everything upside down. And so when I wrote my um, first mystery, The Chessman, I, I almost did, you know, it was, I don't know, 55, 60 chapters. It was almost like 55 or 60 individual short stories that, you know, I kind of tried to craft and hopefully would pull people along. Um, and uh, like Spencer was saying, yeah, um, my wife and I tend to, um, tend to, you know, pick up dogs here and there and, and um, you know, take care. I can't even remember the last time we, um, you know, actually bought one. We tend to kind of inherit them from folks that don't want them anymore or whatnot. And um, Milo here keeps me company and, uh, you know, got a Lucy the Pomeranian who uh, thinks she can take on anyone in the world. And hopefully we won't be hearing from her tonight. <laughs> All right. Well, the year, segueing into my next question, which we have um, we have comments that also have this question. So specifically, how many dogs do you have now, David? But also, if you guys want to round up your pets, I think Jeffrey kind of alluded to them. But tell us more about your own personal pets. Me first. Sure. Uh, my experience in my office is a little different. Uh, I am. It's filled with dogs at all times. And. We have three mastiffs among our dogs. We have 12 now, um, which is the lowest we've ever had, uh, mostly because of COVID. There's really no need for some reason for a rescue right now. But um, we have three mastiffs in a group, and one of them, who is more prone to slobbering than the others, comes over to me while I'm working with my laptop in my lap and goes <laughs> like that and sprays the entire room, including my computer and everything else. So I don't ha quite have the supportive system <laughs> uh, around me um but we have so we have 12 dogs we have three masters We're, we only have two goldens now we have a, a newfie a marema um and five mutts but all our dogs are either very old or um blind epileptic those are the ones we take in so it, it's an unusual experience although for 12 the house feels like it i hope my wife is not watching this i'm sure she's not but uh, the house feels empty well, <laughs> I can't even imagine. My house feels full with this 10 pound one laying right here. <laughs> she makes her presence known. Um, how about you, Spencer? Well, right now there's only one. There's just Pearl. She's a golden retriever and, and uh, she's lovely. She's a great, gentle, loving dog uh, who doesn't really know how to fetch completely. Although we've worked on, she's eight years old and we've worked on a lot. She, she's very good at getting the tennis ball and bringing it partway back. So if we have more time, we'll probably get to perfection in that. Until very recently, there was a, we had another dog, Audrey, who was half golden retriever and half her knees. And she was, just in, she was just a wonderful dog. And so they were both up here. Interestingly enough, well, at least to me, they, there are two ways up to my office, so it's over the garage. And one is through, you go into the garage first and then up the, the stairs that lead to the room. But there's also an outside staircase. So each of them wanted, they'll only come up, one wanted, Pearl would always come up the inside one and have to go out the outside one. And Audrey, the exact opposite. I had no idea why, but it was like being, a, at the end of the day, it was like being a traffic cop, you know, just to get them, to get them up. I love the, the you know, writing is long. Writing is a lonely profession in many ways, I'm sure we all agree. But if you have like this pal, just, you know, lounging around while you're doing it and making no demands or slurping up water at times, it's very encouraging. Yeah, yeah. And Jeffrey, you said you have a beagle and a Pomeranian? Yeah, I've got a Pomeranian who's, uh, I don't know, gosh, has to be about 15. Um, until a couple of years ago, we had an Australian Shepherd, and like David talked some, our Australian Shepherd went blind, and the last two years of uh, her life, and it was bizarre because, you know, we're holding the dog, and my wife's like, I think she's going blind, so I'm doing the thing where I'm kind of poking at her eye with my finger, and my wife's going, knock that off, cut that, that's not how it's done. So we bring her to the vet the next day and tell the vet, I think she's going blind, and the vet starts poking towards her eyes with the finger, and I'm like, huh, huh, huh? 
Um, but I was really amazed. We have a kind of an upper backyard and a lower backyard, and she, you know, mapped everything out. And we wound up getting the Pomeranian, I guess, to be her uh, scene, personal scene eye dog. And we put in a um, little doggy door on the upper deck. And my wife said, you know, Amber's figured that out. I'm like, there's absolutely no way she's figured that out. And then five minutes later, Amber comes walking through, you know, never having, you know, even mapped that before. And uh, she was she was quite an amazing dog. And... Um, you know, 16 years is pretty old, and now the Beagle's four, and uh, Pomeranian's about 15, and they keep us hopping, especially um, Milo is terrified of um, fireworks, so the last couple nights have been interesting. I'm sure tonight will also be promising. I um, I picked up some of those um, hemp calming tablets, which I don't think they, I don't think they did much. Yeah. They don't work so much for mine. She doesn't like riding in the car, even though she has to do it every single day on the way to the bookstore and um, on long road trips. I've tried and I've tried higher and higher doses and they just, they do not chill her out at all. Um, okay, we have a couple questions, which is a good reminder if you're watching, we've got a big crowd watching. That's great. Don't be shy. Um, get your questions in here. It can be for individual authors or for all three. Um, Kelly was wondering, how did you decide which breed your canine characters were be, would be? Um, she can't imagine them as anything else other than what they are. Um, how about we start with Spencer this time? Well, Chet, this is a, a difficult question because Ch we don't really know because all Chet knows about what he is is, is what he hears from people who are rude enough to talk about his appearance in front of him. So he knows there's one scene where Bernie has, or he, a scene where he, where Bernie tried to weigh him by Bernie first picking Chet up and standing on the scale. And the idea was then he would subtract. We figured this out from what Chet, anyway, Chet didn't, the scale ended up breaking somehow. We don't exactly know. And so we don't know. We know he's a hundred plus pounder and his ears don't match, and he's a, a, a mix of some sort. So he's yeah. a big, strong, athletic, a great leaper, uh, and and that's really all we know. He has, a, you know, like so many, he has a wonderful sense of smell and hearing, and that, that's one of the, I don't want to use the word payoff, but one of the things that happen, things sometimes happen unexpectedly in what my grandmother called the writing game, as in, Peter, aren't you going to go to law school instead of trying this writing game thing? So I, um, because Chet is the narrator, all, everything you picture, actually, his, he's a dog, so his sense of smell and his sense of hearing are much more important than his sense of sight. So a lot of the world of the Chet and Bernie series is the world you hear and the world you smell. So that, regardless of his specific read, that's what became important, that it's a canine perspective. Well, and to a certain extent, it was a choice to not make him a certain breed too. So, and, and, and in your- Absolutely, absolutely. Then, obviously, yeah, yeah. Yes, because I, I don't want, he, he doesn't, in other words, this is not an aristocrat yeah. of the canine world. That yeah. he's a, uh, not a, he's just an, an ordinary middle class canine guy. That's yeah. that's what yeah. yeah. All right, um, Jeffrey, how about you? You know, I think in my case, you know, I needed the protagonist to have um, good sniffer dogs um, for hunting down cadavers. So, um, golden retriever, he's got a couple of short haired farm collies named um, Delta Dawn and Maggie May, and um, he's got. Sue, the German, the male German Shepherd, and in the Keepers, he, um, he's he got a new puppy, uh, a bloodhound, Billy Joe the bloodhound. <laughs> Perfect. So yours are, yours are purpose-driven. How about you, David? As, as, as we know, we've got Tara the Golden, and then depending on the, the dust jacket is the, the breed of choice. <laughs> That's how we do the titles, too. It's all based on the jacket. You just write the book to the jacket. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
Isn't that how Hemingway used to do it? Exactly, exactly. They, they gave him the cover for you know all of his, and that's that's what he wrote to. Um, I would ask you to elaborate, but I actually know that that's the case, so you know, <laughs> so it's the real answer. All right, um, let's see. Gail was wondering, do you talk to your dogs differently than most pet owners, given that they must be your muses? And we'll start again with you, um, Spencer. Okay. I love the I, the talking to the dog part. Yes, I talk to the dog. I talk to any any I talk to any dog often. Even like a dog I see going by in a car or it's in a parked car with stick looking out the window. I say hi, how are you? Doing? I mean, I don't know why. It's but um, but one of the things about people do talk to their dogs, and and so Bernie, the detective, does talk to Chet and other humans talk to Chet too. And I don't, this is what, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I don't think people lie to their dogs. So Chet gets the real 411, if people still say 411. He gets, Chet gets real info. So the idea that you're onto a very important thing, at least for me in, in the way I do it. The, um, yes, I talk to dogs and people talk to dogs and I'm very interested in what they say to their dogs. Interesting. How about you, Jeffrey? You know, I think I, I talk a lot to Milo and, you know, I'm sure if I'm taking him for a walk, we have a lot of nature trails. So I'm lucky that nobody's seen me because they'll hopefully think I have something in my ear and I'm making a phone call. Um, and uh, usually uh, he just kind of looks up at me and, huh, you know, but um the Pomeranian, I'm usually trying to, when she gets on a barking spree, it's usually stop, please. Um, I find myself uh, bumping into them and actually apologizing to them when I do that. So that happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you, David? If you're talking about me in real life talking to dogs, it's more about survival for me. Um, <laughs> you know, so I'm, you know I'll, you know, does shut up. I don't care if the FedEx guy is here. Count as a, yeah. uh, <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and we have a 180 pound mastiff that sleeps on our bed. So screaming, move over, you know, I mean, those kind of things. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't describe them as my muses, though. That's for sure. <laughs> Not even the slobbering all no. over the laptop. No, no. Opposite effect. No, definitely not. Okay, we have a very specific question here for Spencer. Is there room for that ferret in Chet and Bernie's relationship? Because Chet hasn't done well with birds, elephants, and other animals. No, he hasn't. Um, and he, of course, Chet, it turns out, well, I don't want to do spoiler alerts, but it, it turns out that this ferret, and the name of the ferret is very important to the plot, but I'm not going to give that away, but the ferret turns out to adore Bernie. And Chet, that's unbearable to Chet when he sees the ferret staring adoringly at Bernie. However, in this book, in the story, it, just in order to save the day, Chet has to come to some sort of working relationship with Griffey, he has, with the ferret. He has to overcome his antagonism if they're going to solve the case. That's what I can say about that. Fair enough. Okay, I'm gonna do one of my questions again because people are endlessly fascinated about a writer's process. So essentially, what does an average writing day look like for you guys? Is it very structured? Is it catch as catch can? Do you outline, do you not outline? All of that. What's your what's an overview of your process? And let's go back to starting with Jeffrey. Well, I think what I, I've normally done is very loose outline, nothing that's going to, you know, be set in cement because then I, I wind up changing it and updating the outline as I go along. And the, um, the third book that I'm currently working on, I just, for the first time ever, I just no outline. I'm just going to, you know, be, I guess, seat of my seat of my pants. And that's, uh, that's been okay. You know? I was going to say to, oh, David's comment. I think I think the bane of my existence are these um, floor to ceiling windows in the in the front room where we can see all the UPS drivers and the FedEx drivers and the neighbor kids and random squirrels that dare step in our yard. You know, so 
Ah. Yeah, I just moved from a um, a small home in a in a neighborhood um, to an apartment in a high rise, and Maisie has gone from being the loudest, most obnoxious dog barking at children on skateboards, and our tree was the hide and seek tree, so like all the kids would come around and scream, and there was construction next door, and she was barking around the clock. And I moved in here a couple of weeks ago, and she's quiet as a church mouse because there's nothing. There's nothing like causing her drama. So it's been delightful. Um, okay, so the question was, what's an average writing day look like? So, so do you write in the morning, evening, daily? Um, is there any pattern? Yeah, morning and evening, but then sometimes I guess I'm um, a binge writer when it, just, when it just hits me and then I want, you know, everything get out of my way because that's when I can maybe turn off 15 or 20,000 words pretty quickly. Um, so I, I thank God when the binges come. All right. But although, and I, I am, I, I get up early. The dogs get me up early, yeah. you know, so cup of coffee, start writing. Excellent. How about you, Spencer? Well, I mean, there are two stages. There's the thinking up the book and then there's the writing of the book. So in the thinking up the book part, uh, as Jeffrey was talking about, in the beginning, I, you know, I would make maybe for the first book or two, I made like an A through Z outline. You know, and that took like a month or even more. And then when I got to about C in the outline, one of the characters blurted out something that was way better than any plans that I had made. And I had to scrap it. So I learned to what I wanted. I, I want to I want to know the main points about what the story is about. I also want the, the story to have an engine that's driving it, a beating heart. Now, a lot of novels literary and not do, do not have this beating heart but in the chet and bernie series the beating heart of the story is the love between chet and bernie and so if i ever get stuck or i don't know where i'm going i just take a step back and i think what's the beating heart and the beating heart is that so whatever happens next has to in some way illustrate that beating heart and also advance the plot so once I know basically, you know, what I knew that this one tender is the bite was going to be about politics. I had a picture of this senator and the beautiful younger woman from a small town, very unsophisticated. I had that idea and I, I knew where I wanted to start. And then I have a few like scenes along the way that I think of as lighthouse. And I have those lighthouses before I start and I want to reach a lighthouse. And then I go on to the next one. And then I just, I don't need to know the ending. I just need to know that it can be resolved in a logical manner that won't let the, the reader down. And then I start. And in terms of my writing day, I mean, I get up, I, be, I basically probably, I either go to the, for a bike ride, for not you, 10 or 15 miles every morning, or first thing, or I go to the gym. And then, uh, and then I come back and have coffee, and then I, uh, you know, write for, you know, four or five hours. And I, most days, not every, like, um, but most, I, I try to, even if I don't really feel like it, I try to advance this, well, in two ways. I try to advance the story in terms of internally, every paragraph, like never, like if there's some beautiful little uh, evocation of, of landscape that has nothing to do with the story, but I'm writing it so beautiful, that has to be cut immediately. Yeah. Everything in the book has to advance the story. And then every day I want to advance it so even if all you do is write 200 words, the day after, you're that little bit ahead. And so Jeffrey's talking about sometimes you feel a flow is really coming, and but you've set that up. You kind of deserve it. And so um, so as long as I just keep it going and then all of a sudden, you know, you're rolling this rock up a hill and then one day it starts to roll. Up. That's It's happened to me over and over. Yeah. yeah. All right, you, David. I don't outline at all. I, I can't. I'm unable to. Um, I don't know what's going to happen three pages down the road. I mean, I'm in the middle of a book right now. I don't know who the bad guy is yet. I'm on page like 170. Um, the, um, I, I once had to do a, what they call a Bible. I was writing a miniseries for NBC. And when you do a miniseries, for some reason, you have to write, write a Bible, they call it. It's like 50 pages. It's more specific than the actual screenplay. And I, I forced myself to do it, and it was awful. And I, I found that it took the spontaneity out of the actual writing of it. Um, so 
I'm fine with the fact that I can't, that I'm not able to do it. Oh, yeah. In terms of the writing process, I write more at night than during the day because I don't go to the vet at night. Yeah. Um, but basically, I goof around until my editor, Kelly, sends me an email telling me what the drop dead date is that I have to have it by or that I won't make publication. And then I go crazy. I'm like, Peter, I, 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 um, I bin- I'm a Jeffrey. I binge like, you know, like crazy and finish it in time. So without that outline, do you ever write yourself into a corner and have to go revamp something? Never. This this is sort of embarrassing to say, but I've now written 36 books. I've never written a scene that didn't make it into the final book. I've never oh taken my gosh. it. Oh, um, and, and it's for a stupid reason. I'll write a scene, and even though if it doesn't seem to make sense in a story, and I just like it and I write it, it then becomes like a piece of the puzzle. So when I'm figuring out what to do, I, I find I have to include that, even though it makes no sense, right? It's mine. I could take it out. Yeah. But I never do. Ever, never, ever do. You find a way no, to make I it can, work. I understand that. Well, it depends on your perspective. But I find a way to make it work to my satisfaction. The readers might have a different point of view. On it, but yes. Were you going to add something, Spencer? Well, I mean, I think David is really, that's really important what he what he's talking about the the in a way you're almost solving a mystery yourself the characters are are your main characters and you are too but the and also what david said about spontaneity just to, it's so important because it's on the page and something that's unspontaneous and has been worked over and reworked and reworked eventually unless you're an incredible technician the life gets sucked out of it. Mm. And you want the book to be alive. Yeah. Um, we have a specific question for David from Margie. If I put it up on the screen, uh, it's going to block faces because it's a long question. So I'm just going to summarize. But essentially, um, how do you make your courtroom scenes seem so authentic if you're not a lawyer? Uh, you know, I have no idea. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I don't think of them as, as authentic, but I get emails from judges and, and lawyers and they say, that, you know, they tell me I nailed it, right? I mean, I have no idea. I, I don't know. It's, you know, I watched the O.J. Simpson trial. I mean, I, I <laughs> that's literally true, right? You know, I mean, I just, I don't know. I picked it up. Uh, I awesome. can't explain any better than that. All right. Um here we go from Billy. Will any of you wonderful authors make a movie out of one of your books? And let's start with you again, David. We'll go in reverse order. If any of you has brought a check with them, you can, <laughs> you can get the right. Um, I've, had, <coughs> excuse me, I've had some close calls. The most, I'll tell you the most aggravating one of all was um, uh, Steve Carell signed on to produce and star in Dog Tripping. Wow. And then it didn't get made. So oh. I, w- I was buying suitcases to carry the cash home in, and it didn't get made. So that's the most aggravating. And, and then Andy Carpenter got sort of close to a TV series, um, but no luck so far. All right. Uh, Spencer. Well, I, I've had a number of adventures of the kind um, that Dave is talking about, but I did have one book, not a Chet and Bernie, one book made into a movie. It was called The Fan. Um, it was a crime fiction book that took place in the world of professional baseball, and uh, Robert De Niro played the fan, and it had uh, Benicio del Toro was uh, was played the shortstop. It was it had a very nice cast, and so I've had I've seen what it's like to go through to the very end, and and the farther you go in the process of having a movie made of one of your books, the less control you have. Yeah. So at the final end, you have nine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you, Jeffrey? Yeah, like David said, I'll be there with the suitcases if someone's going to, you know, cough up some money. But um, as of yet, no. I remember I um, I read a lot of the, the John Rain, Barry Eisler books. Mm-hmm. And um, then, I don't know, 10 years ago, they made one of them into a movie that was just awful. And uh, so, I don't know, I guess my wife wasn't home no one was there to keep me in line. So I, you know, went to his website and I, I said, 
hey Barry, can I hire John Wayne to, or John Rain to take out everyone that was involved in making the movie? You know, and, you know, I hit submit and I, you know, went to bed and slept off whatever beer I had. And I get up the next morning, my wife's back, and I gotta behave myself. And I, I go to the computer. <laughs> There's an email from Barry Eisler. I'm like, oh my god, I pissed him off. And um, he goes, he goes, I know, I know, I, I didn't have any say. I just picked up the check. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I can't remember who it was. Maybe Robert Crace years ago said that, you know, it's just, you have to know, you throw the check over the wall, the, the Hollywood wall, and uh, or they throw it at you and you throw them the book and then there, there should be no more, yeah, no more contact after that. Um, okay. Spencer, specifically to you, why did you decide all the books should be narrated by the dog? I know you kind of already talked a little bit about this. Well, once the first one was, <laughs> there was no going back, right? <laughs> I made a major decision, but it was just partly, I, I think part is the challenge. I mean, I could see there was going to be to do it as, to make the dog as canine as possible. In other words, not a talking dog, not a dog that would know things that dogs shouldn't know, like Mozart or the dog's understanding of what's going on had to be very canine and therefore limited in many ways. Um, you know, in a, a mystery is, is all about, um, salt, you know, gathering clues and putting them in logical order and, deducing something from that. Well, Chet can't do that, you know, and, and and even if he could, you know, some important clue might be about to be revealed and he'd sniff a Cheeto under the sofa and he'd miss it. So he's an unreliable narrator of a very special sort. So whenever, sometimes whenever you have a big challenge, um, when you've cast your net that far, there's a very good chance when you reel stuff, when you reel it in, you're going to have interesting stuff inside. And and so I love it for that, doing it for that reason. The other is that I'm addicted to doing the voice of Chet. When, when I sit down to write, if it's in his voice, it just starts to come right away. So that's bad. So we have a related question and I will ask you this and then we'll move on to the other guys with something else. But was it your plan to have Chet become more human in his thinking as the stories progress? No, it wasn't. And I, if he has, then I've been very sneaky about how that's happened. I, because I think there is a lot of sneaky stuff that I've done in this, but I don't think he's, it's not my plan for him to become more human. But one of the things I think that's happened is that um, there's more depth in the whole series as the books go along. Yeah. Um, okay, we have a question specific for David, but I'm going to tie this into my next question for all of you. So why did you start writing Christmas themed books? But let's start with David. And can you also tell us about what you're working on now and what we might see from you next? Because you've got other series. Um, Spencer's got the middle grade readers. So um, Christmas books, etc. Start with you, David. I started writing Christmas books, not, not out of any spiritual need, but rather the publisher suggested it. So I did, and I think it did pretty well, at least by my standards. So it, I, I write books, I write really much too quickly. And um, so it, it, you know, it takes me six weeks maybe oh uh, to write a book. So if you do the math, I do three books a year. It's 18 weeks. It leaves plenty of time for the football season, right? I mean, so, <laughs> so I'm covered. Um, in terms of what's so, so anyway, so it's you know I I like doing it, and it's uh, and I have the time, so why not? Um, the um, I'm sorry, what was the other question? Well, other what part? are you working on? what are you working on now, or what should we see? Oh, so, what's being published so, next? The, 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 Christmas book, the Christmas book for this year is finished, mercifully. Um, it's called Best in Snow. Um, and I also have not come up with a single title in my long and storied history. Um, um, and then I'm, the book I'm working on now is the next in the K Team series. Uh, okay. And it's, I'm embarrassed to tell you the title. It's called Citizen Canine. Get it? Huh? Oh, yeah. We well, get it. <laughs> Too sophisticated. We get it. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> so that's the one I'm working on now. And then right. um, after that, there'll be two more for next year as well. After that. Excellent. Excellent. Um, all right, Spencer, how about you? What's coming up next from you? Well, after Tender is the Bite, this very similar to David, the publisher asked if I'd be interested in doing a holiday slash Christmas novel. So it's a wonderful wolf uh, comes out in October. And I, I don't know if this is in poor taste, but I just got the advanced reader copy. Oh, so great. No, not that, poor taste. That's what it looks like. And again, it's a reader suggestion. It's a wonderful wolf. I'm working on the next Chet and Bernie that will come after that right now and then the next book is actually going to be a non chet and bernie um maybe in some ways like some of my earlier work although different now and it's called um mrs plansky's revenge and that'll be and then and then i'll do another chet and bernie episode. and that one is going to be also published under spencer quinn or is it going to be peter abrams That's a great question okay. I, I know if it's going to be published okay all right, excellent. It'll be purely Peter Abraham's thing, but what name they put on it, in agreement with me, of course, uh, remains to be seen. Okay, perfect. Um, how about you, Jeffrey? What are you working on? You know, I'm working on the um, third in the series, which is going to be called The Lost. We're kind of um, breaking with finders, keepers, losers, weepers, because the losers just kind of sounded like a bad 80s movie with. Emilio Estevez or something, you know. Um, so um, it's tentatively called The Loss, and Mace and his pack of finders are looking for a um, uh, missing girl who may or may not have been kidnapped. And then I um, I still continue kind of over the years, I'll kind of um, write short stories that appear here and there, and so I've been very slowly toying with compiling them into a collection, but I only, when it comes to that, I, you know, maybe I'll walk across the room and pick up a magazine and bring it over. And then eight months later, I'll open the magazine. So that one's kind of going a little bit slow. I understand. We do have a question specifically for, for you from the fabulous reviewer, Oleen Cogdill. Um, oh. Hi, Oleen. Jeffrey, do small dogs ever make it as cadaver dogs? Yeah, you know, my um, beagle, uh, weighs in at, I don't know, about 25, 26 pounds. I don't, I don't know. The small dogs may not have that good, powerful snout, but my, my beagle is not that big, but um, beagles make good cadaver dogs. And um, it's interesting taking him for a walk because, you know, I mean, he'll zigzag and I watch him and I see him air scenting and then going to the ground. Um, and I, I can generally tell what's going on. You know, a deer was here, or there was a raccoon, you know, someone came by. Um, and, um, but not not in terms of like, um, oh, I don't know, the real smallish, you know, Pomeranian sized ones, you know. Thanks, yeah. Elaine. Um, okay, we have, <laughs> David, why is it quiet? Are you in a closet? <laughs> No, I, I actually am hiding in, uh, we have a guest house. I'm actually hiding there, which is why we're able to have this, this is able to function. Yeah. Right? I, I did a couple of Zoom events from the house and I wound up having to hide in the laundry room um, because, you know, they just they know when I'm on or when I'm on a, an interview, a radio interview. I once did a radio interview with, I think it was with Seat in Seattle. And the dogs are driving me crazy. So I went into the exercise room and I closed the door and you could still hear them. So I went into the closet and I ultimately said to the guy, this is the first time that live on your air, an author is going to come out of the closet. <laughs> so, so, uh, so it's quiet because I'm in the guest house and it's uh, no dogs around. All right. Um, we have a question for everyone. So how much of what's in the news affects your storylines? Um, and let's start with Spencer. Boy, not a whole lot directly. I never, I, no, not a whole lot directly, but tender is the bite is politics plays a very important role, but there's, and in the book, there's a scene where um, the two neighbors on either side are angrily hammering in lawn signs of different colors, but we don't know which is which. 
And there's nothing about our current political situation that's in the book except for the acrimony that made it in. But there, I don't think this contemporary events get into the book, but, but I mean, there are Ukrainian sort of bad guys in this book. In that sense, yes, but it's never like an, ex- there's no editorializing whatsoever in, in the Chattanooga. All right, David. Yeah, I, I agree. It, it doesn't really, enter. I mean, you know, it's part of life. So it, you know, it's like one of the books is about opioid smuggling. Yeah. Right? So technically that's part of current events. But no, I would say not. And I definitely don't put anything political in. I, I put in one of my nonfiction books. I forget which one, maybe Lessons from Tara, um, a story about how Charlton Heston um, in California rescued a 14-year-old chow mix from us and then gave us l- large donations every year. I mean, he was fantastic about it, right? Um, and I, I put one line in there about how we disagree politically, but he was really fantastic, right? If some some sort of benign thing. Yeah. And I got like many people, you keep politics out of your books. I'm, you know, like really upset that I said that. So no, I don't bother going there at all. Jeffrey, how about you? Real life events influence your books? You know, I think, I think more in the keepers, it's more, you know, I bring in Chicago's kind of checkered past. So, you know, I mean, nothing that's going to really anger anyone. And I mean, the, the idea of, um, you know, having a human remain remains detention dog detection dogs as heroes. I, I actually was called to jury duty, and not only that, but they selected me to be on the trial, no matter how I tried to wiggle out of it. And uh, even though I live near St. Paul, Minneapolis, I actually had to drive to a small town about you know 30, 40 miles away. And on the way there. Um, there's a story about how uh, the local sheriff's department had to call out the cadaver dogs because some, you know, sadly, some elderly gentleman had walked away from his assisted living home and they were kind of looking for him. And, you know, when you're um, when you're on a uh, jury duty, there's a lot of, you know, sitting around, sitting around. And uh, so I just, you know, I just started jotting down, you know, ideas. And, you know, I, I, I know a lot of the different other, you know, um, bomb detecting dogs and, you know, drug detecting, but I, I was kind of going, well, how about cadaver dogs? And so I, um, by the time the trial was done, I had to, um, before the bailiff came to collect our yellow tablets, I had to sneakily rip out the last couple pages and shove them in a pocket. So, um, as those were my, my, my notes. (laughs) That's funny. Um, okay. So that's all three of you on that question. I have some David, we're going to be quick on these answers. I've got three or four specific ones to you, okay? Lightning round. Lightning round for David. Do you miss living in New Jersey, and what region of Maine do you live in now? Um, I I haven't lived in New Jersey since I was left for college, so no. I mean, I lived in New York a long time, L.A. a long time. Now we live in Maine, and we're what's called the mid-coast. It's about an hour north of Portland along the coast. Okay, who or what was the inspiration for the character of Marcus? I don't think anyone, although it's it's possible that I ripped off Hawk from the Spencer books, but Hawk's a more developed, multi-layered character than Marcus is right now. I need to start working on Marcus and give him more uh, deeper character. But no, I, I, well, I wasn't conscious about it, but I may have ripped it off from Hawk. All right. Do you have a personal connection to South Carolina because of the positivity in Rescued? I don't even know what you're talking about. I, I don't remember what that is about. Or oh, 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 oh! I remember Hike. His his yeah. Hike South found Carolina. Positively, yeah. positivity no. in South Carolina. Right. No, I have no connection whatsoever. All right. What happened to the law dromat? To the what? Oh, um, he went off to Bangladesh to to help the he and his wife. He got married, and and they went off to Bangladesh to save the world. Um, and then Hike came in, and I've I've since sent Hike to South Carolina. <laughs> There's a new guy, new Eddie Dowd is the new lawyer. 
All right, good job with your rapid fire round. Um, the last question I'm gonna ask all of you, do you have a favorite comment or compliment from a fan? It can be funny or it can be genuine, whichever you would like. Um, how about we start with Jeffrey? You know, I kind of um, got a kick out of that gentleman that uh, from Red Carpet Crash that kind of during the interview spurted out as badass. You know, so, so far that's my favorite. All right, for Spencer. the keepers. How about you? Highest compliment from a fan or a funny story? I don't. Um, there, I mean, I've heard from a lot of fans. Whenever I do something where Chet maybe like I did a a sort of shaggy dog thing at the end of Chet had like this a little lump that was removed at the end of one book, and I thought well, I'm going to wait for the biopsy results to come in the next book, right? And I got so many emails in all caps. You know, if anything happens to chat, I'll never read another word you write, and I will flood Amazon with one-star reviews. So that, you know, and I, even for, for me to point out, he's the narrator of a series. I would never do anything. But I think probably the best thing that happened, just in a positive sense, was uh, in the one book in the series is to fetch a thief, an elephant named Peanut plays a role. And I was doing a book signing somewhere, and um, after it, the, a guy came up to me and he said, "You got the elephant right." And and he turned out to be the zookeeper at the local zoo. So that's one of those little I didn't, you know, I was lucky. Yeah. Good to be lucky. <laughs> Great. All right, David. How about you? an easy one for me. A woman wrote to me once, apparently I wrote in a book, and I had forgotten that I did this. I wrote in a book that Andy was on, on a plane in coach and the seat next to him was empty as people were walking on. And Andy internally in his mind was hoping that an overwork, overweight person didn't come and sit next to him. And I had forgotten I did that, but a woman writes to me that she's really upset, uh, you know, on behalf of overweight people, uh, you know, I shouldn't do that. I, you know, it's body shaming, I guess. So I wrote back sympathetically to her about it. And then she wrote back to me, never mind. I saw your book jacket picture. You're one of us. <laughs> <laughs> so she nailed me. Just nailed me. <laughs> so that was by far my favorite comment. Perfect. Well, I mean, that's great. That's great. All right. Um, our time is up. Thank you all so, so much. I want to mention again that there's a link in the comments if you're interested in more information or to order in any of these books. Um, Jeffrey Burton's newest book is The Keepers. Spencer Quinn um, is Tender is the Bite. And David Rosenfeld is Dog Eat Dog. And we do have signed book plates for um, the Rosenfeld. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure talking with you tonight about dogs and mysteries and everything in between. Thank you so much for being here with us. And uh, we had a great crowd, tons of people who love your books, much love out there. So um, I think everyone enjoyed this very much. Uh, thanks to everyone watching, and I'm going to log us all out. Have a great evening, everyone. Thanks, McKenna. So long, guys. Thanks. Bye, McKenna. Nice to see everybody. Bye. Nice to see Bye, you, guys. too. Nice to meet you, guys.